it's full of open problems and ways people can help. And if this catches anyone's interest, you can see this blog post I have on how to get started in the fit. Yeah, I found it a bit hard to gauge what people's backgrounds and levels of prior knowledge were. So I'm sure that at some point in this talk, I will lose people. Please just like, this talk is modular, so we can go through like half of it with tons of discussion or go through all of it with very little discussion. Either one's fine by me. So without further ado, what is mechanistic interpretability? So the field is based on this core hypothesis that a trained neural network learns human comprehensible algorithms and that these algorithms can, in theory, be understood if we can learn how to reverse engineer them and how to make them legible to us. The model isn't incentivized to learn algorithms that we can easily understand and decode, but it is incentivized to learn structure that has some meaning if we can figure out how the meaning works. And the science is a constant balance between trying to achieve a rigorous understanding of what's going on without just reading tea leaves and tricking yourself into thinking you know what's going on. Um, there's an analogy here between taking a trained neural network and reverse engineering it and taking, say, a compiled program binary and trying to reverse engineer it back to source code. Um, and yeah, uh, before I go further, just want to say that I find having people's videos on more motivating because I have you all on my other screen. And it feels less like I'm talking to a blank, blank wall. Um, but yes. So a key claim. So in my opinion, one of the most controversial claims here is that mechanistic understanding of neural networks is actually possible. Um, deep learning is notorious for being a bullshit science with like no meaning and no structure, where you just throw a ton of data at a thing and it works, and we have no idea why. So my claim that mechanistic understanding is actually possible seems kind of strong. And to make this argument, I'm going to go through a case study of this paper I wrote called Progress Measures for Grokking via Mechanistic Interpretability, the modular edition one that Jordi mentioned. So the setup of this problem is we have a one-layer transformer uh, the architecture looks something like this. You don't need to know the details of transformer architectures to follow this, but... Um, and we train it to do modular addition. We give it um, a pair of inputs um, that are integers between 0 and 112, uh, inclusive. We give it... Each of these are one hot encoded, and the output is um, a single number z, that tries to be x plus y mod 113. And we train this model with a cross entropy loss. And I then try to reverse engineer how it does it. And spoiler, the algorithm I found is simple enough that it fits on one slide. And so why am I looking at one layer models that do modular addition? Um, so this was inspired by a 2022 paper from OpenAI are called grokking. And they found this wild result that if you take certain algorithmic tasks and train certain small models on them, that the models will initially just memorize the training data and perform terribly on data they haven't seen yet. Like it near instantly gets to perfect accuracy on the third of the data we train on, and it's like extremely bad on the data it hasn't seen. But then if you keep training it for a really long time, well after it's achieved perfection on the data it can see, and you just train it on that same data again and again for thousands of epochs, it will suddenly grok the problem. And it will go from worse than random to extremely good at the problem in a fairly narrow window. And my bet was that a, modular addition, such a clean task. Probably there should be an actual algorithm here we can understand. And B, I bet that actually understanding things is a promising route to being less confused about what's going on. And it seems like if you want to understand why something grooks, that reverse engineering what it's learned should be a promising route to do this. 
So any questions on the overall setup of the problem so far? It's a stupid question. What's your definition of grok? Do you feel it's grokked and when do you feel it hasn't grokked? Uh, so I would roughly define grokking as there is a moderate length period where it has near perfect train accuracy and um, about and not very good test accuracy. And then these eventually converge. And by train and accuracy, put... this is just on the training data. Yes. Um, and then if you keep training it, it will eventually converge and validation accuracy gets a lot closer to the training accuracy. So this initial separation where it seems to memorize the training data and then a later convergence that looks like generalizing. And I mean, I can put arbitrary numbers on all of this to try to formalize what exactly I mean by good and not very good, but that's the spirit of any definition I have to come up with. And, and just, you're saying just, it seems it's not random, like as in the mm -hmm. algorithm that, that it converges on, you just, mm -hmm. you've decided, you've given it a, a value, as in you like, you've decided that it's somehow interesting. Couldn't just yes. be some random bullshit convergence. Uh, yes. Hopefully you'll be convinced by the end of the section that it's a real app. Uh, yeah. To uh, Sadia's question, you there's not like a rule in general for how you know that you should keep going. I think the origin story of this paper is they just accidentally left something training and then it magically worked. And they were like, what? We should write a paper about this. This is fascinating. I would roughly think of grokking as a cute mathematical curiosity that may tell us something about mysteries of deep learning rather than an inherent property of all systems. And you should always leave systems training for ages just in case. Yeah, just a comment, just so it's very clear for everyone. The, the red lines in this plot, the model has never seen. Yes. And also, I just thought it would be useful, at least for me, just to spend like three sentences on your simple transformer model, just, mm -hmm. just so that we have in mind. Um, yeah, so at a very high level, the architecture of a transformer, so neural networks are really good at taking vectors and converting them to more vectors with more computation and processing. And the high level question you should always ask when staring the neural network is what is the input? How is that converted to vectors? How are the vectors transformed to more vectors? And um, how are these vectors converted back into an answer? So the inputs we have um, are integers, uh, say five and a hundred. Um, and then there's a special input that's just a fixed symbol for an equal sign. And there's a learned lookup table that maps the 113 possible numbers and the special equal sign token to vectors. This magic lookup table is, le is a learned matrix called the embedding. And it produces a series of three vectors. In general, transformers always act on sequences of representations. The layers of the transformer divide into things that can move information around between vectors in the sequence. Uh, these are called attention. And at a very high level, the way attention works is uh, for each vector in the sequence, it looks backwards at previous things. It selects a weighted sum of previous terms uh, via this thing called the attention mechanism that's not really worth getting into but is approximately like, how relevant are they to the current thing? And then uses this weighted sum to select some subspace of the earlier vectors to copy over to the final vector. And it does this for everything. Though in this case, this is like a really simple model. So the only thing you need to care about is that the equal sign selects some information, some weighted combination of the X and Y to move to the end. And then the second type of layer is an MLP, which stands for multi-layered perceptron. 
which is basically the classic kind of neural network you may have come across, which is just a massive matrix multiply followed by an element-wise nonlinearity, like a ReLU or a JELU, but just applied to every element of the internal vector independently. And then another matrix multiplication and adding a bias vector. And uh, the output of each layer is added to this thing we call the residual stream, which you can think of as a running tally of all layers that have come so far. So it starts with the embedding, we add the output of the attention layer, and then we add the output of the MLP layer. And then at the end, we need to convert this sum of vectors to an actual answer of what the model thinks the answer is. This is a discrete task. There's 113 possible answers. Um, so what we want is a probability distribution over the output, and we feed it into a function called a softmax that converts our vector to, um, sorry, we first have a linear map from our vector to a 113 dimensional vector. And then we apply a softmax to convert that to a probability distribution. And we're trained to maximize the loss, the um, log probability of the correct answer, which is called cross entropy loss. And is equivalent to maximizing the log likelihood ratio. Uh, well, Ventura Transformers, any questions on that one? All right, so how do you even start to get traction on what's going on inside a neural network? The first thing we did was trying to understand the embedding, this lookup table that maps the 113 possible numbers to an internal vector. And there were a bunch of hints from the literature that if you do different kinds of dimensionality reduction on the embedding, you get circles and weird periodic structure. Like if you do TSNI, a complicated nonlinear dimensionality reduction, or uh, a super simple PCA, and just do a scatter plot of the first two dimensions, everything is circular. And if you look anywhere in the model, everything is periodic. So you can look at uh, single neurons activations. Uh, you just take a single element of the internal vector of this MLP layer and do a scatter plot of that across the pairs of inputs. And it's really periodic. You look at the attention page from the equal sign to the X token, and it's really periodic. And so these were a lot of hints that not only is something structured going on in the train network, note the this, these are all possible 10,000 data points. The model only saw one third of these during training. So it somehow learned to interpolate a periodic pattern to the two thirds of data it's never seen before. And so this is like a really big hint. Something is going on here. And the insight that really unlocked a lot of the structure in this problem was to apply the Fourier transform to the input space of the model. So the embedding is a 113 by residual stream size vector. And we can apply a Fourier transform to the 113 dimensional part of it. Rather than thinking of it as a lookup table, um, we think of it as, uh, yeah, rather than thinking of it as a lookup table, we think of it as just a 113 dimensional vector and do a discrete Fourier transform to it. And then for each Fourier term, so sine and cosine of different frequencies, we take the model, uh, we look at the norm of this. So just, are there certain Fourier terms that the model decides to represent? And it turns out the answer is yes, it's incredibly sparse. The blue and red bars are sine and cosine of different frequencies. And we see that the model chooses five to six frequencies to care that it cares about. It extracts sine and cos, it, it extracts an embedding that is a linear combination of sine and cosine terms of these small handful of frequencies, and it throws away everything else. And uh, an initialization, it looks like this, super dense. So there's like 
it's clearly doing something purposeful. There is some real structure here. And uh, skipping ahead a bit. Um, oh, and the other easiest thing to get traction on is looking at the outputs. And it turns out that the outputs are a sum of cosines. So we have these pair of inputs, A and B, or I was calling them X and Y earlier, and a possible output C. And the logits uh, are the term for the thing that goes into the softmax. They're an A by B by C tensor. And for each pair of inputs A and B, we do a softmax to convert this to a probability distribution over possible Cs. And it turns out that the logits are really well approximated by a linear combination of terms that look like this cos of a plus b minus c times some frequency, uh, actually the same frequencies that turned up here, um, except one of them is vanished. For some reason I never quite figured out. And this linear approximation explains 95% of the variance of the logics, which when flattened are a 1.4 million dimensional vector that can be really well explained by just a rank five linear approximation. And um, why is it the case that cos a plus b minus c is a reasonable thing to have in the logits? Because you can think of a softmax as basically a softening of an argmax. What is the c at which the logits are biggest for each a and b? And cos is maximized when the input is zero. So this is maximized when a plus b is equal to c, or equal to c mod the frequency of the cos. It's chosen a frequency such that you get mod n from the periodicity of cos. And uh, so c equals a plus b mod n is the correct answer. It's the biggest thing that comes out of the softmax. And why does it bother to learn five different things rather than just one? because the difference between the biggest thing and the second biggest thing, like cos of zero and cos of one over 113-ish is not that big. But the difference between, but the position of the second highest is different for each frequency. And so they will all constructively interfere at zero because each frequency is maximized at zero. And they'll destructively interfere everywhere else, which you can see in this graph at the bottom. The colored lines are the different frequencies, and the dotted line is their sum. And so if we can figure out how the model uses its internal weights to do this computation to convert the internal Fourier terms to sums of sines and cosine, um, internal uh, sine and cosine terms to the sum of cosines, We've, this is just an algorithm for doing modular addition. Uh, to Sadia's question of does this pattern appear for any choice of embedding, um, the embedding is a learned matrix by the model. I've just given it a 113 by residual stream size matrix and said, please do gradient descent to this to figure out what is, what is useful to you. So it's yeah. like the convergent choice of embedding the model learns. Yeah, I mean, like the size of, I'm sorry, uh, for any size of embedding, I should have said, because here we have 113, uh, and like whatever input is, we are using one hot encoded, right? But in general, mm -hmm. we choose a size of embedding, uh, depends what choice we choose, and we have to make an optimal choice for the transformer or any other model to work, right? Yes. Other things don't tend to work. The reason for this is that the model wants to map things to like sine and cosine terms. And if you do something like, I don't know, a binary encoding where each binary digit is an embedding that gets added together or a linear embedding where there's just a one dimensional thing that you multiply by the number, it's now a really hard thing to map that to a sine and cosine. While one hot embeddings are just an arbitrary lookup table so it can learn an arbitrary function. Generally, one-hot embeddings are the main thing I see used for transformers on language data or mathematical data. 
that you can get more continuous things when you have transformers trained on image data because pixel values are continuous and you'll use transformers for everything so i'm sure the world is full of random niche things they get trained for thank you um, that's what i was asking no okay so what's the algorithm the model does so at a very high level the model has learned that modular addition is isomorphic to composing rotations around the unit circle or composing rotations of, of the regular end. We can interpret the embedding, mapping things to sine and cosine of different frequencies as representing them as a parameterization of these rotations, um, sine and cosine. The MLPs and attention use their nonlinearities to compute element-wise products between these terms and add them to get sine and cosines of A plus B, the composed rotation. The output map to the unembedding is a um, linear map that further composes with the inverse of the rotation of C. So we rotate backwards by each candidate answer. And we then project onto the x-axis, taking cos. And uh, if cos is maximized at zero, as I was describing, and so rotating backwards by exactly a plus b will get you to the biggest output. For, and because it's a rotation, you get modularity for free. And um, we can just go inside the model and figure out the, each of the intermediate terms of the algorithm and the process of computation is represented, uh, as I'll present now, unless there are any questions on the algorithm. Um, actually, I actually have a question, but it's a bit far back. Go for it. Uh, I just wanted to understand the distribution that you had in the very beginning which was uh, some sort of a periodic distribution. And, and I'm guessing that's kind of why you chose some sort of a trigonometric function because you want some sort of periodicity. Is that correct? So I did not choose this algorithm. This algorithm was spontaneously learned by the model via gradient descent. I chose to do a Fourier transform because I saw that the model had spontaneously learned trigonometric functions. And I thought that a Fourier transform would be the sensible way to decode this. But this was this algorithm was entirely spontaneously learned by them. And I went in kind of blind, expecting it to learn some kind of arithmetic processing unit style thing, and figured this algorithm out by reverse engineering what had been learned. Yeah. So because I'm a bit lost on what what the starting point is and why you take a Fourier transform. Why did I decide to take a Fourier transform? Yeah, yeah. I mean, apart from you can always uh, split any function into a Fourier basis, but mm. I- So the reason I did that is because I had all these hints of periodic structure inside the model. Yeah. So these two are standard techniques for dimensionality reduction. This was just literally taking a number inside the model that I thought might have meaning and plotting a heat map. And you see that things are really periodic. And it was a bit of a leap of intuition from everything keeps looking periodic, let's do a Fourier transform, but not like, I don't know, some completely unmotivated flash of genius. And I was really surprised by how well it worked. Man. And yeah, a theme that I've kind of found often recurs in doing mechanistic interpretability is that the model has some internal representations that make sense to it. And part of the challenge of decoding it is learning what those representations are and how to decode them to something that makes sense to me. Uh -huh. Like this is a lot more meaningful to me than like a bunch of waves. Yes. So, all right. It's a bit of a bold claim to say that I've actually understood the learned algorithm. How do I do this? So I've already presented the first line of evidence, the surprising periodicity, which is a real hint that something tricky is going on. 
The second line of evidence is this mechanistic evidence. The certain points of the algorithm, there is just a linear map doing something very interpretable in the Fourier basis. And I can just look at it and read off this up. So here I've taken the linear map from the MLP activations to the logits. And I have applied a Fourier transform on the output basis and um, done this for the neurons that represent frequency 14 terms. And what we see is that this linear map basically is just sine and cosine in frequency 14 or 14 times 2 pi over 130, technically, and not anything else. And it's just super clear. You can just read off that it's doing the thing that it, we expect it to do. Um, line of evidence three is that we can zoom in and approximate individual neurons with sines and cosines. So uh, this predicts that the neurons are representing sine of W A plus B, and cause of WA plus B. It further turns out that neurons specialize into individual frequencies per neuron and represent things that are just linear combination, just a quadratic form of sines and cosines of that frequency in the two inputs, A and B. And despite being a 12,000 dimensional vector, this Frank six um, linear combination of polynomial terms can explain like almost all of the variants for almost all of the neurons. They have the form the algorithm predicts. And finally, we can verify that we've correctly understood things by going and doing some targeted ablations. If we ablate everything on the output logits except the cosine terms that we think the model is trying to predict, model performance actually improves. And if we ablate any of the frequencies internally that we think the model is using, performance gets significantly worse. While if we ablate any of the other frequencies, performance scarcely changes. Ablate means delete or kill or set to zero. Uh, sorry for all the ML John. And yeah, so that's the app. Uh, is this useful? Can I mean, you're mathematicians. Maybe I don't need to give you just for this point. But can we use this understanding of the algorithm to understand why the model works? And before I present my answer, I kind of just want to emphasize that grokking is weird. Uh, the strongly established wisdom in machine learning is that sometimes your models will memorize the data it is trained on and never generalize the data it hasn't seen. Sometimes it will generalize the data it hasn't seen. But it will never do one and then suddenly change its mind and switch to the other. And this is a very weird thing. The standard story of um, why things memorize is that your training data set was too small and you needed more training data. Not that it could just keep looking at that training data again and again. And um, I kind of want to just give everyone 10 seconds to try to generate your own guess for why this mysterious phenomenon happens just to underscore that it's quite weird. Anyone want to make any guesses for why grokking happens? No spoilers if you read the paper. I would think it has to do with the, the, the energy landscape or so. Can you give us a hint and tell us before grokking, what do you get? Do you get free modes? No, you get something else, right? So how how is the pathway to grokking? Like when you haven't grokked, when you sort of, your training error is still low. Mm -hmm. Sorry, you, you, yes, your training error is, is very small, but your testing error is high. What is the approach to the to the Fourier modes? The well, that's basically the next slide. I all want to take any guesses before I give the answer. But that's that's a great request for a hint. Is it because of the sine and cosine waves together, like uh, the net effect? What's happening? in the Fourier transform? So the Fourier transform is just a thing that I did to the model. The sine and cosine waves internally are a thing that it learned on its own. So that doesn't explain why it learns, learns those, especially since intuitively the gradient signal is like kind of weak. 
It's not literally zero because these models were trained with a form of regularization called weights decay that incentivizes it to have smaller weights. Uh, grokking doesn't happen if you don't have any regularization. Uh, regularization is ML jargon for a thing you put in your loss function to incentivize the model to be simpler. You're penalizing the weights, basically. Yes. Uh, Sorry, so but, it happens when you do penalize, or it happens when you don't, when you just try to fit, when you sort of in the interpolation uh, region? I couldn't get it to happen when I just tried to fit. Some ah. people have reported that it does happen when you just try to fit with no regularization. Ah, okay. Grokking is very fiddly to get right. All right, so the literature is full of different hypotheses for why. Like the model just kind of randomly wanders through the lost landscape and gets lucky. There's, it just takes time to learn the right representations. It's part of a more mysterious phenomena called double descent and random other things. Uh, but the great thing about this work is that we can look inside the model as it's learning, as Georg suggested. And what we see is that during this seeming plateau, the model has already started to learn these Fourier. And the, we can just look at it as it trains and see that the embedding gradually learns structure and sparsity and significantly deviates from randomness. And what looks like um, sudden generalization is really just an acceleration of this already existing process of becoming sparse. And my interpretation of this is that there's three phases in here. Uh, memorization, the initial phase from here to here, where this is basically uniform, it memorizes the training data and performs terribly on the test data. Circuit formation, where the model goes through um, this seeming plateau, but is really forming the circuit internally, but it just hasn't got good enough at the trick-based solution to actually generalize. So test performance is still worse than random because it's also memorizing. It's somehow interpolating between the two solutions. And the final phase is what I call cleanup, where the model gets so good at uh, generalizing that it no longer needs the memorizing parameters. And weight decay creates an incentive to clean up the no longer useful parameters. And a bad solution plus a good solution is a bad solution. Um, so you need to also clean up or at least significantly reduce the memorization in order to generalize. And so the sudden generalization of grokking is actually an illusion. It's not that the model is just wandering around the lost landscape and suddenly gets lucky. It's that the model is purposefully interpolating to the correct solution, but it um, takes there's some property of the lost landscape that I have not yet explained that makes it harder to reach the true solution. So it gets to memorization first, but the true solution is simpler. Um, thanks. The true solution is simpler. And so even though it has memorized, it's still incentivized to interpolate to the true solution. And uh, it is only when it's got so good at the true solution, well, I call it true, this is editorializing, the model doesn't care. Um, it's only when it's got so good at it that it cleans up the old solution and it looks like the model learns the answer. And we can uh, use our understanding of what's going on here to dig inside the model and devise uh, what we call progress measures, smooth metrics that underlie hidden progress to disentangle these two solutions and more quantitatively show what's going on. So the first metric is what I call excluded loss. Um, excluded loss is um, the model's, excluded loss is the fraction of the model's performance that comes from pure memorization. I delete the generalizing solution and I look at how well the model does on the training data. And we see that during the first phase, memorization, excluded loss does really well. 
But then during the seeming plateau of um, circuit formation, excluded loss gets significantly worse, culminating in being worse than random. Uh, because the model is interpolating between pure memorization and pure generalization and getting worse at memorization in the process. And we can further see that the generalization and test loss is driven by cleanup with the second metric, what I call restricted loss. Restricted loss restricts the model to only use the trigger-based circuit and essentially doing cleanup for it. We remove memorization. And what we find is that during circuit formation, the model does get better, um, but then during cleanup, it gets dramatically better but that there's a lag where it gets dramatically better before test loss gets better than random. Showing that the drop in test loss is driven by cleanup that doesn't affect the restricted loss, rather than uh, being driven by uh, just getting better at generalizing in the first place. Any questions on my story of what happens in grokking and the progress measures? I have a question. This is yeah. amazing. This is like I was completely on the wrong track. I thought it was, you know, something with the optimization or something. So this is just really fantastic. Is is it true that that like well, what's I understand now? Well, I think it's my understanding correct that you need regularization mm -hmm. because you sort of you penalize, you know, the weight somehow. So if you did some kind of L1 regularization, you know, you want something sparse, and so you just breed all those, you know, the Fourier modes. Mm -hmm. Um, so is it like you first you gain much more by getting, you know, um, you know, some of those peaks right, and then you sort of um, have all the other ones non-zero. Um, but then you gain more by uh, in the loss function with the regularization uh, and pulling down all those other modes. Is this a correct understanding of what's happening? Uh, pretty much. This uses L two regularization or L one. Yeah, yeah, but so I mean, it's the same thing. But yeah, yeah, yes, yep, yeah, pretty much. It cool. learns. I mean, I think there's lots of interesting questions here trying to really decode what's going on. And we have some accompanying code and collab notebook for the paper if anyone wants to play around. Like, I think that could be a pretty interesting study, just trying to really understand what the gradients are, uh -huh. how the gradients come from the generalizing versus memorizing solutions, and how exactly this represents the, what's going on in the lost landscape. Uh, there was a recent paper from the DeepMind alignment team on what's up with grokking by Vikrant Varma that people here might also be interested in that tries to come up with a quantitative model to explain what's happening in terms of how efficient the different internal solutions are. But, yep. Yeah. What anyway, happens when, in... when, when, your, when your dimensions don't, when you can't resolve the frequency, let's say? So um, when you know your 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 embedding space is too small, um, how does how does the regularization then well, how how does it deal with and how do you like by increasing the dimension um, how do you become so, better and better by being so, able to resolve more and more frequency like more and more of the modes? Do you mean uh, the do you mean uh, how does it do you mean when you say the embedding size do you mean the 113 number, or do you mean the residual string size number? I mean the dimension of your uh, of your feature space, or whatever it's called. Yeah, yeah. So it turns out that you don't really need that many dimensions for this to work. So sine and cosine are just get mapped to a direction, which is a, a thing that often happens inside neural networks. Is that they just choose a direction and say this rep represents some feature. And so you only need two per frequency. I have found that the model, so here my feature size is 128. I found that when you make it, when you make it too small uh, to like 16, the model just kind of fails to learn. Uh, interestingly, at 32, the model given enough data will learn the algorithm without needing much regularization. It will learn to generalize if you give it, say, 90% of the data. I think there's some effect where 32 is like the kind of right point where it's not enough capacity to learn a more complex memorizing solution. 
Mm -hmm. uh, this is just a random investigation I did once. I didn't look into it very hard. All right. This is a very quick question. Uh, why is yeah. more overfitting when we have such a sparse training data as well as you have regular regularization already there? So uh, why does it even overfit in the first case? There must be something else. If there's so much noise already uh, available for it to generalize, uh, why is it so bad in the beginning? Yeah. That's a great question. I do not claim that I have properly answered that question, though there's a recent paper from the team I work on at DeepMind that tries to get an answer. I just put a link in the chat. My intuition is that there's a distinctive property of the true solution is that it involves many components of the model in different layers working together like the embedding learns the sine and cosines because the neurons multiply the sines and cosines because the unembedding maps these to the cosines. And each component only makes sense when the other components are there. Um, if you, and my hypothesis is that this creates what's called a phase transition like behavior in the model where it suddenly, rather than smoothly and gradually learning, rather than sm performance smoothly and gradually improving, it can make gradual progress towards the eventual answer. Uh, but it's like, when you have half of the unembedding and half of the neurons, there's a much stronger incentive to make the neurons and the unembedding better than when you have 10% of the unembedding and 10% of the neuron weights because everything is composing with each other in a delicate system. And this is just a difficult thing to learn, but gets learned in a slow and gradual way. While memorization doesn't need any careful setup, models are good at just conforming like any setup into some kind of mm, complex memorized representation. This is pure speculation. If you go to Appendix E of the paper, I have a bunch of thoughts around this. And if you look at the paper I put in the chat, that tries to give a more quantitative explanation. But I think there's lots of interesting questions here. But anyway, I will also talk about this phenomena of superposition, because it's also interesting and completely different. Um, and I am much time left. So a key question we want to understand if we want to do mechanistic interpretability on models. Um, here, I'm jumping from these kind of tiny algorithmic models to real language models and real vision models on real tasks. We want to understand how the models represent their thoughts in turn. And a, what seems to happen is that a lot of what models are doing is learning to extract features of the input, like this is a picture, this picture has a cat ear in this pixel, there's a curve over here, this is persuasively written text, or this is unusually buggy Python code, features like that. And the model learns to represent these internally in ways that can independently vary of each other. And the, if we learn the right techniques, we can learn to attribute different bits of the model according to which features they've extracted. The, the internal representations of the model are enormous vectors. Um, frontier models have like 10,000 dimensional vectors inside of them. And models learn to map individual directions in this vector space to meaningful features. And a core goal in mechanistic interpretability is learning where these features are whether they are properly thought of as directions, which directions they correspond to, and how to reverse engineer this. And models are just really big. You can't understand a billion parameter thing or a thousand dimensional, 10,000 dimensional activation as a single object. You need to somehow break it down. And so a core question of mechanistic interpretability is how to do this. And the hope in the early fields was that individual neurons were always interpreted, that they corresponded to features. Uh, by neuron here, I mean 
an element, um, a element of the standard basis immediately after an element-wise nonlinearity, like a ReLU or a sigmoid or a gen. The reason that this was a reasonable hope, even though this is just one basis and seems kind of arbitrary, is that um, element-wise activation functions are not invariant under rotation. It makes the standard basis special when, say, you apply a function like a ReLU to each one. Uh, ReLU is just a max with zero. So if it's negative, it gets set to zero. If it's positive, it gets kept the same. And this is a really core building block of modern neural networks. And so the hope was these activation functions create an, a bias in the model to have these neurons be meaningful. But the problem is that in practice, this is often not the case, especially in language models. Here's one neuron in a tiny one layer language model that fires on Korean text, citations, HTTP requests, uh, dialogue, Japanese, and a bunch of other stuff. So this story that neurons ought to be meaningful because they have these element-wise activation functions seems to be false. And the hypothesis for why this happens is what's called superposition. So a fact about high-dimensional spaces is that you can fit many more vectors in them than you have dimensions. If you're happy for your vectors to be almost orthogonal to each other, rather than actually orthogonal. Um, you can actually fit in exponentially many, but I don't think language models actually go that way. And the hypothesis is that models have meaningful directions, but that rather than the directions all being orthogonal to each other, the directions are almost orthogonal. And this lets the model noisily simulate a much larger model where each feature is an, is an actually orthogonal direction by compressing it into a smaller space. And I think this is a thing that models do a lot. There's lots of fascinating facts about high dimensional geometry that likely go into how this works. And we just don't really understand how this works. And there was this really great paper out of Anthropic called Toy Models of Superposition. I highly recommend people here go read it. It's one of my all time favorite papers. And what they did is they tried to study this question of does, can we even in principle exhibit a language model that uses superposition to usefully learn and represent features? Their setup was they trained an autoencoder, a model that tries to compress its inputs to a smaller dimensional space and then recover it. Um, they gave it an input space with a bunch of independently varying features. And they had it linearly map these to a low dimensional space, linearly map them back up, and then gave it a out ReLU on the output and tried to look at how well it could recover the input features. And because it was mapping to a smaller dimensional space, this is a test for um, can models use compression where they fit in more features than they have dimensions? And what they found is that models can do this, but that a really important property is the sparsity of the input, how frequently input features are zero. When the input features are always on, the model just represents two of them. Uh, so this diagram, we have five input features that get linearly mapped to a two-dimensional space and then mapped back up to a five-dimensional space. And what we find is that when the features are always there, the model just uses two dimensions. But the, when we start making them zero a bunch of the time, they start to learn these surprising emergent geometric structures. Um, these are pairs of antipodal pairs where the model has decided to pack in two features into one dimension. Because the features are sparse, it's very rare that both are there at once. And so the model can exploit the sparsity to deal with the fact that sometimes this dimension represents feature one 
sometimes it represents feature two. And when they're more sparse, it compresses into a even more efficient geometric structure of the pentagon. And they have found this beautifully bizarre mathematical structure inside the model, where this time they give it 100 features and 20 internal dimensions. And what they found was that the model would spontaneously cluster um, its learned representations into like classes of features that formed orthogonal subspaces to each other. So over here, the model just learns a bunch of tetrahedra, uh, efficient way to pack four features into three dimensions. It spontaneously clusters into orthogonal three-dimensional subspaces. And the in if you make the features more sparse, it forms denser and denser configurations. This model has specialized. So some features get mapped to triangles, some features get mapped to antipodal pairs. Uh, larger models, uh, sorry, uh, sparser models learn pentagons and square antiprisms, which are even more efficient ways to fit features into small dimensions. And then also learns this thing that doesn't seem to be particularly corresponding to some structure of dimensions that they called the everything bit. And as far as we can tell, there's just a lot of fascinating properties of higher dimensional linear algebraic spaces that language models learn to exploit in order to do computation more efficiently. And um, I'm not gonna have time to get into it, but if you go to Toy Models of Superposition and some of the other papers that I cover later on the slides that I haven't had time to get to, you can see some of the work studying how this happens in real models, what kinds of mysteries there are, and what things we're still really confused about in how geometry of high dimensional spaces can be used to do useful computation and employ these bizarre immersion compression systems. And as someone trying to work on this stuff, he's really confused. If any of you want to try to help out, I would really appreciate this. But yes, sorry for the somewhat rushed tour of superposition. Um, and yeah, thanks a lot for all the interest. I think I'm at time. Just, I'll just put the link to my slides again in the chat if you want to go and look at any of the papers I've discussed. Uh, yeah, I'll probably hang around for another few minutes if people have any questions. So I know we're at time. Thanks heaps, Neil. Yeah, so I have a zillion questions, but maybe, <laughs> well, who has a question? Maybe one question is like, you know, imagine that you're an enthusiastic mathematician, you know, very interested in this stuff. What would be the most, you know, what do you consider kind of the, the two most interesting questions at the moment, hmm. you know, from a mathematician's point of view? Yeah, so I think the two ways, the two things that one could do that would feel exciting to me, uh, the first is just trying to better understand how models can actually usefully use superposition to do useful computation. Because I think there's lots of rich mathematical theory here that no one has discovered. So um, some ongoing work that I didn't have time to get to is I've been looking into how models represent facts. And um, we found that models can we built this tiny toy model simulating a language model uh, that uses two, a one or two MLP layers to just memorize a big lookup table of pair, mapping pairs of integers to true or false. Uh, this is analogous to how models know that, say, uh, the name Michael Jordan is an athlete, while Keith Jordan is not an athlete or something. Michael, uh, Keith, and Jordan are names in isolation that don't have much meaning, but when combined as a pair, they have meaning. And we found that models can re memorize many, many more facts than they have neurons. There seems like there should be some rich theory here um, for like how this works, what kinds of structures of the internal uh, neurons are exploited, and how we could use this structure to decode how facts are represented in language models. 
But all of my basic ideas for how things should be nice uh, just haven't really worked out. And models can clearly memorize many, many more facts than they have neurons. And these questions of how models can use neurons to do this compression just seems fascinating and confusing to me. The second direction that I think someone could exploit uh, explore is more along the lines of the grokking stuff I was talking about, where I think that just um, either tr just trying to really dig into the structure of why grokking happens could be really interesting. Like, why is the lost landscape the way it is? Or trying to dig into just training models to do other kinds of algorithmic tasks, other tasks with mathematical structure, and seeing what kinds of mathematical properties we can find that they learn. Yeah, those are probably my three bids. Uh, looking into toy model, different toy models of superposition, especially how neurons are used. The toy models of superposition paper has a list of open problems at the end, and it's just a gorgeously written paper that I highly recommend. And training models on other like algorithmic or mathematical tasks and trying to reverse engineer what structure comes out of this. Thanks heaps, Neil. Now, thank you for this really beautiful talk. It's very inspiring. Awesome. Yeah, thanks a lot for inviting me and all the great questions.